Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, Improve Workplace Safety with this Hospital Infection Prevention Practice, sponsored by Nozen. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine. I'll be moderating today's event. We would like to thank you all for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a couple of minutes, but first I have a few housekeeping items to share with you. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. After today's presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session with our speakers. To ask a question, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and press the send button. You may ask your question at any time during the presentation. You do not have to wait for the Q&A to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible today, but we might not get to every question. The good news is that any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. After this presentation, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, but I'll tell you about that a little later. This webcast will be archived so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, you can visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events, or you'll receive a link in our post-event email. With that, let's introduce our speakers. With us today are Sue Barnes, Dr. Ron Singer, Dr. Michael Maniak, and Bill Spanhake. Sue Barnes served for 27 years as the National Infection Prevention Director for Kaiser Permanente and now works as an advisor and consultant for numerous professional associations and industry partners. Dr. Ron Singer is an orthopedic surgeon whose career has been devoted to refining and teaching surgeons across the globe about safe surgical practices and new techniques for the benefit of patients. Dr. Michael Maniak is a urologist who serves as the Chief Medical Officer for Crisis Response and Travel Medicine for multiple Fortune 100 companies. He is also an adjunct professor at George Washington University. Bill Spanhake is the Chief Science Officer for Nozen, where he leads laboratory and clinical research and development. He is also a Professor Emeritus at the Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation today. Dr. Maniak, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thank you very much, Barry. And I would like to welcome all of our uh, audience today and thank you for joining us today. I think you'll find it interesting and informative. We have some learning objectives uh, and uh, they're listed here and we want to make sure that you understand what we're gonna talk about. Uh, and then uh, we will uh, fill in various parts of information as we go on. First of all, uh, we want to make sure that it's recognized by you that the role of the nose is under-recognized in infection processes and that uh, the prevention strategies should include some form of nasal uh, desanitization. So uh, nasal sanitization, excuse me. The nasal decolonization uh, will be presented with clinical evidence and uh, various recommendations for you uh, to show you that the some real world examples, but also the, the clinical evidence, which is pretty, uh, pretty strong. Uh, lastly, uh, we want to show how this information can be applied within the workplace for your safety uh, objectives. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, uh, we're all aware because of the pandemic, there's been an increased uh, uh, inc incidents and knowledge and awareness about different things that are involved with infection. And we're very clear and have been in, uh, in, uh, inculcated with the, uh, uh, these various principles here, such as social distancing and uh, telework has been introduced to nearly every workplace. Well, along with that has uh, been uh, education and training about infections and how to prevent them. So that's very important for the workforce uh, particularly among those that don't have a medical background or have not had to face this before. Next, uh, a, a very important component to this is to report and track any infections and uh, the uh, quality of your infectious uh, prevention processes so that we can uh, amend or uh, 
or add to those. And then lastly, I think we've all become aware of the need to sanitize our hands and that personal protective equipment is an important part of this. Now, the piece that's been missing in most places has been the prevention of infections uh, through the process of the nose. And uh, that we believe is a very important component of this whole process of inter interrupting infections, uh, particularly in the workplace. But also you'll see that this is a personal uh, e event as well. Next slide, please. So with this, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Bill Spanhake, who as you heard is a professor for a long time at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, where he's now Professor Emeritus. He's the Chief Scientific Officer for uh, Nosen and Global Health Technologies. Bill? Thank you, Mike. Um, I'd like to uh, start with a few facts about the nose. Identified in this first slide by the arrow, the nasal vestibule is the virtual microbial rainforest of the nose. And it's easily identified as the area at the front of the nose where the hairs are. The, as we'll discuss in a moment, the vestibule serves as both a reservoir as well as a source for pathogen transmission. This is possible because of its somewhat unique environment as well as its location. Unlike the sinuses and other mucosal areas of the nasal cavity that have high levels of inherent protective mechanisms for killing and removing microbial pathogens, the nasal vestibule has limited immune protections and provides a somewhat safe haven for these germs. This carriage of bacteria in the nose is referred to as nasal colonization. There's an important difference between colonization and infection that I like to make clear. All individuals, all of us, carry a wide range of microbes in our nasal vestibules. That includes bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Different from infection, this microbial community is generally stable, and it's not rapidly growing or causing tissue damage or disease. For bacteria, approximately 30% of the general population, that's about one person of every three individuals sitting around you right now, carry some form of Staphylococcus aureus in their noses, in addition to other potentially pathogenic strains. Uh, in the case of Staph, Staph aureus, it's uh, antibiotic resistant version referred to as MRSA or MRSA is often present in this mix. Both forms of Staphylococcus aureus are significant causes of both hospital acquired and community acquired, that is non-healthcare associated infections. In addition to the potential for transmission to others or the environment, <clears throat> when the immune system is weakened or other conditions arise that present opportunities for infection, the nasal vestibule provides a rich source of pathogens for self-infection. In fact, it's been known since the 1950s that nasal colonization with staph is a major risk factor in patients undergoing various medical and surgical procedures. Importantly, a wide range of respected clinical studies clearly demonstrate that taking action to reduce nasal carriage can dramatically reduce this infection risk. So how does this impact the workers and the work environment? The amount of pathogen brought into a facility referred, is referred to as environmental burden. And this is directly related to the infection risk that will result. As you might imagine, the worker risk will be higher in densely populated workplaces and in those with inherently high pathogen burdens. The risk will also increase with the cumulative amount of time that individuals are going to spend within that space. Examples of some of these kinds of environments would be high workforce manufacturing facilities, uh, retail, corporate offices, education, restaurants, police and fire departments, air and sea commercial, as well as military vessels, 
sports teams, correctional facilities, and the like. Another important point in the case of uh, to to make is um, in the case of an existing infection uh, that might damage cells of the respiratory system. Uh, that would be exemplified by influenza and SARS-CoV-2 viral infections. The susceptibility of the tissues to a secondary bacterial infection is increased. This adds to the severity of the respiratory disease. And the nose has been shown to be a typical source of these bacteria. Daily decolonization or sanitizing the nose with an antiseptic results in a very rapid and broad spectrum reduction in the carriage of all pathogenic microorganisms present, whether endogenous or acquired, decreasing uh, personal as well as overall environmental burden. In the work environment, this strategy could be used to lower overall risk infection and help promote a healthier and safer workplace and workforce. So a word about the decolonization procedure. The application of a nasal decolonizing antiseptic may vary a bit from manufacturer to manufacturer, but in general will involve two things. The first is saturation of the tip of a single use amp uh, ampule or cotton swab applicator with the antiseptic. And the second is delivery of the antiseptic to the two nasal vestibules just inside each nasal opening with a rotational application around the vestibular walls. Overall, the decolonization process can take less than 60 seconds up to several minutes, depending upon the product and lasts for up to 12 hours. So compared to hand sanitization, Nasal sanitization is also very easy and it's very fast to do, but it needs to be done far less frequently. We truly entered an era of new attention to the importance of infection control over the past year due primarily to the overwhelming nature of the corroded, uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, previously in hospital settings, infection prevention and control strategies were directed almost exclusively to the patients of the facilities. The need to extend the scope of these strategies to protect the health of the medical workforce was eye-opening. And it called into focus the importance of addressing disease transmission among workers in that workplace. This health concern is literally changing the way we do business at many places of work in order to keep both workers and customers safe. My colleague, Sue Barnes, will now present some of the guidance, uh, insights, and tools borrowed from the work, uh, from the healthcare community that are forming the basis for workforce disease prevention strategies. Sue? Thanks very much, Bill. So next, as Bill suggested, I'm going to be sharing an overview of evidence and experience relative to nasal decolonization, which as Bill explained, is also known as nasal sanitizing. And that is simply the process of reducing the burden of infection causing pathogens in the nose. So this slide summarizes the guidelines regarding skin and nasal decolonization from four national organizations. The REDUCE trial is a large study sponsored by CDC and the AHRQ where three decolonization protocols were compared. Of the three, the most effective was found to be universal decolonization. This protocol eliminated nasal screening and involved daily chlorhexidine bathing and mupirocin nasal antibiotic ointment for five consecutive days. Among patients in these ICUs, the presence of MRSA or MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, 
was reduced by 37%, and bloodstream infections caused by all pathogens were decreased by 44%. These professional guidelines serve as the foundation for infection prevention programs and practices. But since they're based only on products and practices, which have been proven effective with large randomized controlled trials, which have been published in peer reviewed journals, they often lag behind actual practice, which is driven in part by innovation. Infection prevention products and practices are constantly evolving in order to support achieving and sustaining zero preventable healthcare associated infections. Early adopters of innovative products and practices pave the way for this. Once established on a small scale as effective, these approaches first become best practice through word of mouth, through trade journal publications and clinical conference presentations, which then leads to adoption by increasing numbers of hospitals. However, it's only after, as I mentioned, large randomized controlled trials have been published that any changes are made to professional guidelines. Consequently, Innovation is the pathway to ensuring that guidelines reflect the very best that we can do to reduce the risk of preventable healthcare associated infections. Decolonizing or sanitizing both the nose and hands is critical because there's a constant risk of clean hands being contaminated by touching our pathogen laden noses. And as you can see on this slide, there are a lot of parallels in the benefits of sanitizing the nose and hands with products containing 60% alcohol. As mentioned, nasal decolonizing or sanitizing has been proven to reduce the risk of healthcare associated infections, including surgical and central line associated bloodstream infections. And of course, any infections caused by methicillin resistant Staph aureus or MRSA. But especially important now during the pandemic and flu season, nasal sanitizing has also been proven to prevent secondary bacterial respiratory infections in flu and COVID-19 patients. However, so far, there are minimal studies demonstrating that nasal sanitizing reduces the risk of viral infections. Although we do know that enveloped viruses, including flu and COVID-19, are far easier to kill than Staph aureus bacteria, which nasal sanitizers have been proven effective against. It's important to note that FDA does prohibit skin antiseptics including nasal antiseptics for making virucidal claims. But because of the in vitro lab data proving the virucidal effect of alcohol, both the CDC and the WHO promote alcohol-based hand sanitizer for reducing flu and COVID-19 transmission. And if you're interested in more information on the existing nasal sanitizing products, you can visit the link on the final, final slide in this presentation. So that's www.sanitizeyournose.org. Nasal decolonizing or sanitizing was introduced in healthcare initially for prevention of surgical site infections. More recent studies have demonstrated that the use of nasal antiseptics, not only on patients, but also by the surgical team in the operating room, as well as by the healthcare team in neonatal ICUs, results in further reduced infection rates. Ongoing study in this area will no doubt demonstrate similar outcomes with other types of healthcare associated infections. To me, the expansion we're seeing with nasal sanitizing in healthcare workers, as well as in other industries, but such as sports and travel, seems like a natural progression 
resulting directly from positive outcomes reported in hospitals, as well as from the current increased community focus on prevention of infection during the pandemic. So in conclusion, we know that nasal decolonization or sanitizing remains an important infection prevention tool in ICUs and the operating room, but we're learning that it has an even numerous, uh, more numerous applications, both within healthcare and in the community at large. So at this time, I'd like to hand off to Dr. Ron Singer, who will share his experience with nasal sanitizing from the perspective of an orthopedic surgeon. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sue. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a surgeon's perspective on how we've used alcohol-based nasal sanitization in my surgical practice over the five uh, years um, beginning in 2016 to current, and sort of how we've taken this from uh, patients in our operating rooms to their families, to our staff, to our administration, and to others within our organization. In, in healthcare, you know, we take a bundled approach to infection prevention. There is no single uh, silver bullet for prevention of infections. Uh, and we know that infections can be truly devastating uh, for our patients, you know, in terms of pain and suffering, but also in terms of lost time from work. So we've op adopted this idea of care bundles or a bundled approach uh, for infection pre prevention. So for example, we know for sure that you know, hand washing and, and mask wearing are fundamental uh, to, to our efforts to re prevent infection. But, you know, we know now that this probably isn't enough. And so, you know, what we have done in our surgery center environment is we've implemented a whole bundle of strategies. And so just like to take a couple of minutes to share this uh, with you and sort of the, talk a little bit about the results that we've seen and the progress that we've seen over the past five years. So, so we have this care bundle. How do we prevent infections? Okay. So, the night before surgery, you know, we have our patients clean their skin with chlorhexidine wipes. And we have them do, do this from their chin all the way to their toes. And this is the evening before. And this will kill harmful germs on their skin. Additionally, from a facility standpoint, we electrostatically clean our rooms, our ORs, uh, the night before surgery. And this will kill the biofilm on surfaces. So we're trying to sort of decrease the bio burden in our entire facility, both on human beings and in the environment around us. We use a HEPA ultraviolet uh, air recirculation system in the OR to pull harmful bacteria out of the air. We use negative pressure sort of vacuum sealed dressings that have been shown on average to reduce infection risk by 63%. And I think probably the most important change that we've made in the past five years is we use an alcohol-based nasal uh, decolonization or sanitization product in the noses of all of our patients beginning three days prior to surgery and continuing for 14 days after surgery. And the idea is to kill all of the harmful germs in the nose uh, for, uh, for up to 12 hours per treatment. And this has been shown to reduce the risk of infections around the time of surgery by up to 80%. And so we have this sort of whole you know, bundle or matrix of, of strategies. From the standpoint of you know, the results and kind of what we've seen in my practice and, and at my uh, surgery center. So Essentially, we, we've incorporated this with all of our total joint patients in, in the surgery center environment that dating back to 2016. We've done over 600 joint replacements at, with a three to four hour post-operative stay and really have not had a single deep infection that required a re-hospitalization for removal of a, of a hip or a knee implant. Uh, our findings have been corroborated really with the study out of the University of West Virginia Medical Center that demonstrated that nasal sanitization in the perioperative period for patients undergoing joint replacement decreased infections by about 80% when combined with the existing care bundle. So once we saw how effective that this was at our facility, which is a joint venture between the Medical University of South Carolina and, and uh, Surgeons of North Carolina, we implemented the nasal, de nasal decolonization with our nurses, with our scrub techs, with our administrators, and ultimately the family members that would be in direct contact with our patients during the recovery process. So, you know, the environmental burden is lower in our facility because of this approach, not only in our surgical facility, but also in our patients' homes by killing germs in the noses of family members that will be around these patients in the week following surgery. So we talked about, you know, up to 28% uh, of, of the U.S. population being carriers for 
uh, either MRSA or uh, some type of, of staphylococcus. Uh, and so these are our these are our coworkers. You know, these are our bosses. Uh, this, this is we're not talking about the healthcare environment. We're talking about the U.S. population now. So as it turns out, you know, people walking into their workplaces every day are colonized with many of these pathogens in the nose, which can make uh, those around them uh, become ill. So, you know, my ask um, is that you consider adding nasal decolonization to your workplace safety bundle. You know, masks are great, but we know that masks probably protect others around us more than they protect ourselves from getting ill. Uh, we know that hand washing is critical, but as, as it turns out, it's probably not enough. So, you know, we've had to adopt a whole bundle of strategies to decrease our infection rate. And I would recommend that you consider a similar approach uh, for your facility. Certainly prevention is the key to breaking this chain of, of infection. You, know, you may have your industrial facility locked down beautifully, you know, but what about vendors coming in and out? What about uh, penetration of this perfect uh, bubble that's been created? And you know, we know that, that uh, our, our coworkers are doing a better job of washing their hands, but unless we're, not, unless we're sanitizing our noses, we're just simply not interrupting this continuous cycle where our hands contaminate our noses and then our noses are contaminating our hands. And I think we're, we're now developing a very fundamental understanding of this in the healthcare environment. And I think this translates to other environments as well. You know, daily uh, sanitization of the nose, it's cost effective, it's easy to do, it's well tolerated, and it's been proven to reduce infection rates and improved outcomes. So, you know, I feel like we're starting to see the light at the end of this tunnel with respect to the pandemic that's changed the world forever. I think the timing to incorporate newer proactive strategies, such as nasal sanitization, is now, just as it was with alcohol-based hand sanitizers 10 or 15 years ago. It certainly seems progressive, uh, but the science supports it, and I believe it will become a widely accepted critical part of workplace safety. I believe the strategy will translate not only to less lost time out of work uh, from our employees, but I think it will also demonstrate to our employees that as employers, we're being proactive with the strategy to keep the workplace safer. So uh, with that, I'd like to hand it back to uh, Dr. Maniak, who will discuss some practical approaches to nasal sanitization in the workplace. Well, I'm waiting for the lag here. Uh, I, <laughs> Dr. Singer, thank you very much for that great presentation. It's always great to see clinical data that backs up uh, something that's a, a hypothesis. And we certainly have seen that with uh, the clinical data that you've reported. And it's, it's, uh, it's very striking and, and you're very uh, positive about this. And, and that, I think that's great. So uh, I think that we have seen these, this slide before, but now we've added this puzzle piece uh, of nasal sanitization. And that's an important part of the puzzle, as, as you've seen, and clearly demonstrated in the clinical trials. And uh, it should be part of the continuum here of the infection prevention strategy that we use in our workplace. So how do we do this practically? Well, there are some suggestions here that I think uh, will, will help anyone who is interested in doing this. And I hope you're all interested. Uh, and, and the first is that you need to identify and contact a manufacturer so that you have a product that you can work with. And what the benefit of doing that is that instead of just buying something off the shelf, you actually have uh, can uh, employ the expertise of that particular uh, organization uh, about their product. So they can, they can help you select uh, what you need, but also scale and customize this product based on uh, what your needs are in your workplace. And they vary from all over, the, uh, all over the places you can imagine. The other thing that they will be able to do is that they will have a program for instruction and handouts and uh, be able to provide a tutorial to your, uh, your, your workforce uh, about how to use this and how to incorporate it into their daily life. Now, along with that then comes the, the need to educate your employees. And, and uh, you can, um, I don't think you can incorporate this very easily without doing that. And therefore the educational component is very important. So uh, how would you do that? Well, you, you may wanna set up a clean entry station where people are funneled into the workstation before they start working and can get, uh, get sanitized and, and then go about their work. 
uh, I think it's uh, been very effective to add signs, not only in entry, but throughout the workspace to remind uh, the, the workforce that uh, this is important to do and that uh, it is uh, also in conjunction with the hand sanitization, which has been readily accepted already. So uh, then because of that, uh, and the fact that you encourage your staff to use these products, then they are able to sanitize their nose and therefore protect their, their families and their, the safety of their families. So it's very important that the education is a key piece here. Then once, and in conjunction with that, you wanna identify champions in your workforce. So these are people that will be early adapters and ones that are uh, buy into the story and understand the, the, and recognize the importance of this component in uh, preventing uh, workplace uh, infections. So uh, th they will help in turn others that are either reluctant or not quite recognizing how important these things are. And, and so if you have uh, champions within the workforce, then uh, they, they will help you expedite this type of uh, program in, into your workplace. Work so what are the benefits to this? Well, uh, clearly I think you can see that it contributes to a healthier and more productive workforce. Uh, and also, I think from a mental health uh, perspective, it shows that you as the company are doing something to uh, help their and promote their health and that you have their, their health and welfare, uh, you know, uh, hold, you hold that in high regard. So uh, along with that, these, these types of programs help support the goals to reduce absenteeism and to improve the, the uh, presenteeism, if you will, uh, of, of the uh, work people to show up in the workforce. Uh, if they recognize that you're trying to help them and you've got a program that helps uh, prevent those infections, that will encourage people to come to work. Now, the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is that this helps reduce healthcare costs. Because if you have infections, then you're, you're gonna have associated healthcare costs and they can be fairly high uh, and spread out over uh, a larger workforce, then that could become significant. So this helps reduce the healthcare costs not only of just antibiotics, but also of physician visits and allied care health uh, healthcare worker uh, visits. So there is a decreased uh, um, cost that goes with a good program. Uh, the important thing is to is that uh, again that we protect both the employees and their families through uh, this type of a program, and and that's a very key thing and is, uh, shows a very. Uh, positive uh, effect uh, for, for the entire workforce and the fact that you have their well-being at heart. So just to summarize briefly what we've talked about today uh, is, first of all, I think you've been able to recognize now that the nose is a portal to infection and then it's been under-recognized in the past and not paid much attention to. Now we have uh, are starting to get significant awareness about this and we need to educate everybody else about this. And the fact that, uh, uh, you, you know, that this is, this is a, a source that we can interfere with. Uh, I mean, I think it's striking that a person touches their face a uh, hundred times a day. If you think about it and, and reflect on your own activities, I'm sure you're gonna agree with that. I certainly did. And I was aware <laughs> that was a problem, but you know, uh, th this, is, this is the first step here is to understand that that's a portal that needs to be uh, addressed. Now, um, the uh, other thing that we've learned is that this sanitization process has shown not only in conceptually to be effective, but with clinical data, which is very important. You can talk about something, but until you show actual results in a clinical setting, uh, it it's, it's remains conjecture. This is not conjecture anymore. It is used in over 600 hospitals throughout the country and, and very effectively. You saw from Dr. Singer, uh, the type of uh, data, the, the percentages of decrease of infections, that is very critically important. Now, uh, the, the third piece here that we think is a key uh, take home message is that, um, that this addition of nasal sanitization can certainly strengthen uh, the workplace infection prevention strategies that are already in place. You've seen how that's a missing piece of the puzzle. Well, let's add that piece of the puzzle to the story. And uh, if you do that, you're gonna have a positive outcome from those situations. So, uh, 
the, the last thing I want to leave you with is a, a resource that you can go to. If you have more questions, please email us at uh, sanitizeyournose.org. And if you visit that uh, site, you will see there are more resources and more data available than we had time to expand uh, today for you. But in, in closing then, I wanna thank you all for joining us. I hope you found this interesting and informative and we're gonna open the floor for uh, questions right now. And I, I, at this point, I'll turn it back over to our moderator, Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maniak. And uh, thank you so much to all of our speakers for sharing your expertise with us today. Just a reminder to our audience members that if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and click on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question and press the send button. Before we start the Q&A, I wanna let everyone know about an evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after this webinar. And your input is really important to us because it will help to improve our future webcasts. Okay, now let's get to some questions today. So first I'd like to um, address Sue. Sue, we've had a couple of questions come in about this topic. Um, and folks in the audience would like to know, could you please explain the difference uh, between the various nasal antiseptics? Yes, yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, there are three primary agents. Uh, there's mucuricin antibiotic ointment, there is the alcohol-based nasal antiseptic, and there is the iodine-based nasal antiseptic. Mupiracin antibiotic ointment has been around the longest, uh, but it has significant disadvantages, including ongoing development of mupiracin-resistant strains of bacteria, including mupiracin-resistant MRSA. It also, it's not, it doesn't take effect immediately. It takes five days of application to reach full efficacy. And it's typically applied by the patient. So compliance is sometimes an issue. Uh, on the other hand, the alcohol-based and iodine-based nasal antiseptics have come to market more recently. And there's ample evidence proving equivalent or better efficacy than mupiracin. Uh, both the alcohol and iodine products have good safety profiles and are immediately effective when applied. The main difference between the two, in my opinion, is that the iodine product can sting and stain, but the alcohol product is clear, it applies cleanly, and it has a pleasant citrus scent. And it is the only uh, antiseptic that has been tested and studied and published on um, regarding application on healthcare workers in addition to patients. The iodine product has not been tested and studied and published in terms of application on healthcare workers. Thank you for that, Sue. And I'd like to direct this uh, next question to Dr. Singer. And um, our audience member, Dr. Singer, asks, uh, in today's workplace, what would be the top three or four maybe measurable benefits that an employer can expect uh, by deploying the, the use of daily nose and by employees or either as a standalone solution or, or bundled with a workplace safety strategy or wellness program? Thank you. Yeah, I think certainly it should be bundled with all the common sense things that we've learned and have been driven home, you know, during this pandemic. Um, I don't think that that uh, any of these products are going to replace, um, you know, washing your hands and and uh, uh, safe workplace, uh, you know, cubicles and, and, and barriers and, and that sort of thing. But I think the benefit, you know, in my mind, um, is keeping our workforce healthier. Um, I think that uh, time will show, and I think the data over time will show that we have less time lost from work. Um, I will tell you from, uh, from our employees uh, at our facilities where we use the, um, the alcohol-based product that um, uh, the employees just appreciate it. I mean, they, they, uh, the, 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 the one that we use is, is very pleasant. It's very well tolerated. It has uh, it has emollients in it to keep the nose from drying out. It's citrus flavored. So they actually, it's, it's uh, the nurses, uh, 15 nurses, when, when I exposed them to this a number of years ago, all raised their hand and said, where do I get this? <laughs> so it's well tolerated. Um, I think our employees are, are very um, appreciative that we're actually doing something that helps them. They understand that 
masks are probably helping everybody else, but, but putting, you know, 62 or 63% alcohol in your nose is probably something that, that helps them. So I think it's, I think it's uh, a sense of um, employee satisfaction. I think it is um, less lost time from work. And I think that's where we, I think those are things that we know. And I think time will, will show uh, you know, that those things are true. Great, thank you. And the next question I'll direct to Bill. Uh, Bill, someone asks, uh, when should people sanitize their nose? Should they do it in the morning after work? Uh, for example, when going into to crowded areas? Well, the, uh, the typical protocol is to, uh, to uh, decolonize the nose uh, in the morning prior, prior to work. Uh, and then through the course of the day, um, at the end of the day, you can do that once again as you go, as you go back home. Um, the good thing about uh, using a product that is designed for daily use is that it, it can be used more than the, uh, um, the, the minimal number of um, applications in order to achieve the goal of decolonization. So if you happen to find yourself in a situation where there's a, a high likelihood of, of a great deal of um, a burden, uh, microbial burden in the environment, you can, you can uh, apply it once again. So it can be applied as needed um, as many times during the day pretty much as you uh, feel is necessary, but typically it's morning and evening in, in uh, most cases. Okay, thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Maniak, I'm gonna direct the next question to you. Uh, one of our audience members wants to know, uh, can you tell us any industries outside the healthcare industry who are currently using this approach? Well, actually, uh, I, probably the, I, I know there are companies and in different industries that are using this, but I think Bill may even have uh, a better idea of that because he has uh, been involved with this a long time where this has also been adopted. I do know there are uh, other types of industries that use it. Bill, maybe you'd like to take that question. Sure, Mike. The, um, uh, the product is, is um, uh, being used, uh, the alcohol product is being used in a, in a variety of um, uh, different environments. So at corporate headquarters, uh, there, um, there is uh, use of the, uh, of the product, we have a couple of sports teams that that are using it. Uh, the um, um, the uh, pr production line and um, and factory manufacturing. Um, there's use in those er in that area as well. So it's um, uh, a police force and fire group, um, the fire department. Uh, workers are using that as well, firemen. So um, it, uh, it has a broad range of possible uses and uh, many of those are uh, having a great deal of success with it. So um, it, uh, that's something that's going to be growing, I'm sure. Okay, well, thank you, Bill. Um, Sue, I'm gonna direct the next uh, question to you. Um, one of our audience members would like to know, why is it important to sanitize our noses even after the pandemic subsides? Well, that's a great question. And uh, the way I would answer that is uh, that, you know, the bugs don't go away. Uh, like Dr. Uh, Singer and Man Maniac and Spanak, he um, have described there are normally a lot of bacteria and viruses and fungi that can just naturally uh, reside in the nasal vestibule. And these can be, uh, these can contaminate your hands and then can be spread to other people and can cause disease even um, in the absence of a pandemic or in the absence of the flu season. So I would say, you know, I've made it a part of my daily regimen, part of my daily hygiene to apply uh, the alcohol-based nasal antiseptic um, at the beginning of my days. And especially when I'm gonna go out into uh, areas that are crowded. And I think it just makes sense. There's no side effects. Uh, it's got a great safety profile. There's no downside to it. There's no resistance that the bacteria will not re develop resistance to alcohol. 
Uh, there's, there's no uh, allergic reactions to alcohol. Uh, so that, that's my best uh, response to that question. Great, thank you, Sue. And Dr. Singer, uh, you know, masks have become commonplace in our daily lives now. And one of our audience members would like to know, uh, do I need to sanitize my nose if I wear a mask? I would say absolutely yes. Um, you know, I, I think that the science has, has taught us that uh, masks are probably more effective in preventing others from becoming ill uh, than they are from protecting ourselves. Uh, we, can, we can double up on masks, we can use electrostatic masks, there's all kinds of technologies that are there but at the end of the day, they're probably protecting those around us more than they're protecting, you know, ourselves. So I sort of uh, everything is a kind of a football analogy for me. And I see, you know, I see the uh, I see the mask as, as sort of, uh, you know, a, a kind of a defense. Uh, and, and I see, you know, you, you know, decolonizing our noses as sort of going on offense in terms of, you know, disease prevention. And um you know, I, I do, you know, I would say also to support what Sue said about the last question, you know, look at what's happened with, uh, with the flu, you know, in the last, you know, uh, six months. Uh, you know, the hospitalizations for flu have been reduced significantly uh, just with the approach that we took for the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I, you know, I see this as sort of being the next step you know, to, to be very, you know, proactive in terms of, you know, reducing lost time from work, you know, workplace related uh, little mini epidemics that we see when the flu runs through the office or, or something along those lines. So I think it's sort of a offense defense thing. And, uh, you know, to, to answer the question, I would just say very directly, uh, I, I would do both at least at this point in time. Great. Uh, Bill, a question directed to you. Um, one of our audience members would like to know, how would you recommend employees obtain nas nasal sanitizers? Uh, do they need to do it with, uh, without a doctor's prescription? Is it possible to do that without a doctor's prescription? Bill, you're on mute. The question is, uh, the answer is absolutely. The uh, the product itself is an over-the-counter designed for, um, for uh, daily use by, um, uh, by individuals that, um, that are concerned about, uh, about cleanliness and, and, and their own health. Uh, they, they, it, can be, um, it can be obtained from um, uh, uh, sources uh, that, that are, I believe, described on our, there are links on our um, Sanitize Your Nose website that describe the, the full range of, um, of possibilities and how that, how uh, general public might be able to have access to that. So that would be the place to go to get that information, but you don't need a prescription. It's an over-the-counter drug um, regulated through, uh, by the FDA through uh, its monograph system. So. Um, uh, there is no prescription needed for that. I'd like to, I'd like to add another uh, uh, point to uh, Dr. Singer's response about the mask plus the, um, plus the nasal decolonization. The, the, the one thing that a mask can't address is the carriage that an individual has. And, and we know, we've known now for quite a while that risk of carriage is the, is the greatest risk for infections in individuals who become susceptible to infections. Uh, so it, it, the, the mask does not address the question of nasal carriage and that is uh, in and of itself a critical component. And um, in the absence of, um, of doing something that risk will remain with the individual despite the masks. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, for my next question, we'd like to go to Dr. Maniak. Um, the question from our audience is, uh, can nasal sanitization be applied to pre-hospital caregivers? And the example uh, the audience member offers is EMTs. Oh, yes, I, I would think uh, that would be actually a very good target for this program. You know, I was an EMT for five years when I was in college. And uh, you're going into all kinds of situations where you don't know 
what what's in that environment, uh, and and it could be something very infectious. Uh, but also, you're 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 usually in contact with a lot of different people, and so by that nature alone, you're you're going to be more exposed. So I think it's a great idea to use this nasal sanitizing uh, strategy uh, for for those types of people, uh, first responders, uh, you know, people that interface with the public a lot. Uh, I think it's a great thing. Excellent. And um, Sue, you mentioned side effects previously, and one of our audience members would like to know, um, are there any common side effects when using an, an alcohol-based product? No, there, there really aren't. So a lot of folks are concerned about drying because we know that alcohol as an antiseptic can cause the skin to dry. But the um, formulation of this nasal antiseptic includes emollients that are, so it's designed as a product to eliminate the risk of dryness. And there, there are no other side effects. So it's got a great safety profile. Excellent. And Dr. Manjik, the next question I'll direct to you. Um, folks in our audience would like to know, um, how can they buy or get access to products that can sanitize the nose? Well, uh, there, there are uh, different types that, um, of, of products that we talked about. Uh, I, I would think that uh, if you go to sanitizernose.org, you're going to find information on those products. And uh, the other thing you could do, you could certainly uh, Google those terms, so mupiracin and uh, alcohol-based uh, sanitizers, and, and you'll find, I'm sure, a fair amount of information in that route. Uh, there, there are various various ones that are available, but uh, uh, you know uh, you, you need to select the one that works best for you. And this system, I can tell you because I use it personally, uh, is very effective. And it's very it's just to echo what Sue just said. There are no side effects to this, and and uh, does not dry out your nose or cause problems. So uh, I think this is a good product. I'm sure there are others that work, but uh, I like this. One. Excellent, thank you for that response. Um, we discussed dryness a little bit, Sue, uh, and, and um, I'll direct this to you or to Bill, whoever would like to take this, but an audience member asks, would a 60% alcohol product contribute to nasal dryness and nosebleeds, um, especially maybe in dry climates or dry winter weather? I'm here in the upper Midwest, we get a lot of dryness in the winter. Um, is that a concern at all? Well, it would be if you were using hand sanitizer in your nose because that would uh, that has a tendency to to produce a drying effect. But with the nasal antiseptic, as I mentioned, this particular one that you'll find on nasal uh, sanitizernose.org uh, is formulated with an, with emollients to prevent dryness. So it can be used in any climate um, successfully. Great. Thank and Bill, you, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's that, that's the key point, uh, Sue. There, um, this, uh, as I was, as I said, and others have, the this particular uh, alcohol-based product was designed specifically for everyday use, uh, uh, a couple times a day, like hand washing and brushing your teeth and that sort of thing. So. The, the emollients um, are, uh, are very effective in doing what they need to do and, um, and dryness is not an issue. Even, uh, I, we're from the East Coast, but I go out to uh, the West quite a bit where it's quite dry and um, I've never had, I use it on a regular basis and I've never had a problem with, uh, with dryness under those conditions. So it, it should not, that should not be the case. Great, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sue. Uh, the last question I have here for our, our panelists today, uh, with the director, Dr. Maniak. Um, and our audience member wants to know, uh, you discussed a little bit about resources before. Where can someone go if they wanna learn more or to find materials that they could share, uh, for example, with their employees? Well, I think an excellent resource is that sanitizeyournose.org site because it'll have clinical data there and it has a, a broader, a, a more detailed explanation of the points that we made today in our presentation. So I, I, I like that as a reference uh, and I've given that to refer, reference to other people who have asked that very question. So, you know, I think uh, that's a great place to start. And then 
uh, obviously, if you're used to using the computer for searches, you can find uh, prompts in, in that sanitizeyournose.org uh, program and, and then follow further if you want to learn more about those particular aspects. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that response. Um, we have run out of time for today's event. I'm sorry that we didn't get to everyone's question, but just a reminder that all unanswered questions will be forwarded along to our speakers today. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you also for uh, taking the time to share your feedback via our survey. Please do that if you would. And um, I'd like to thank our outstanding presenters today, Sue Barnes, Dr. Ron Singer, Dr. Michael Maniak, and Bill Spanik. Everyone from our sponsor at Nozen, and of course, all of you who joined us today. This ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Take care, everyone, and have a safe day.